Hello everyone, welcome to my videos on elementary differential equations. This is video number 6 for chapter 2. In this video, we start looking at separable equations. Let's introduce the general idea. Let now y of x be the unknown. Here we study the first order equation that can be written as the following y prime, which is dy over dx, is a function f of x and y. It depends on x and y, but it takes a particular form. That is, I can write it as a fraction of uh, a function m depend only on x over a function n depend only on y. For this type of equation, we can now do the following manipulation. We can move ny to the left hand side to join dy, and then we move dx to the right hand side to join mx. Now we see that the left hand side only depends on y, and the right hand side only depends on x. So the variables are separated. That's why these are called separable equations. And now we integrate both sides. The left hand side we integrate in y of the function ny, and the, the right hand side we integrate in dx of the function mx. Working out the integrations of ny and mx, and we get the antiderivative of these two functions. So we'll get some functions of y equals to some functions of x. And since these are all indefinite integrals, there is a there is the arbitrary constant. Okay? So in the end we will get a implicitly defined solution for y as a function of x because this as written is not explicit that y equals x something and it's something of y equals something of x. Okay, again I would like to call the attention that there is the integration constant implied by the indefinite integrals. To demonstrate the method, we now take a simple example. Let's consider this equation, dy over dx equal sine x over 1 minus y square. And I have initial condition y at pi equals 2. We immediately observe that this is a separable equation. It's written here as a, a function of x over a function of y. So let's move this term to the left. We have all the y's to the left and move the dx to the right and we have all the x on the right. And we take the integrations on both sides. Now working out the integrals, then we have integrating 1 we get y, negative y squared we get negative 1 third y cubed and then the right hand side integral of sine x is negative cosine x. And then don't forget the arbitrary constant c. For this example, um, there is an initial condition given, y pi equals 2. We can now use this to find that constant c. So plug in um, x equal pi, y equal 2 into this expression. So we'll have y is 2, so I get 2 minus a third, 2 to the 3, and then x is pi, I get negative cosine pi plus c. So all these are numbers, c is the only unknown. One can easily solve it to get the value for c, which is negative 5 over 3 here. Okay, putting the value c back into the and general form, we have the solution for y, which is now only implicitly given. So y must satisfy this equation, y of x, but we 
don't have the expression y of x explicitly. So for um, these uh, separable equations, um, sometimes it is very hard or not possible to write out the explicit form of the solution. Let's take one more example. Our second example is also a simple one. dy over dx is equal to a polynomial in x over a polynomial in y and with this initial condition. Okay, so we can readily separate the variables. We put terms of y on the left-hand side, so 2, y minus 1, dy equals, and we keep the x on the right-hand side times dx. And then we integrate both sides. So working out the integration, we have the following. So this is y minus 1 squared and equal, integrating here, I get x cubed for the first term, 2x squared for the second term, and 2x for the last term. And then there is an arbitrary constant c here. Now you might be wondering um, why I write the left hand side as y minus 1 squared, why I didn't write it as the term by term integration, which will be 2y will integrate to y squared, and 2 will, negative 2 will integrate to negative 2y. The reason is that if I write it in this way, I will be preparing myself to work out an explicit form of the solution. And why I can do that is noticing if you open up this square, you get y squared minus 2y plus 1. So I basically added a constant 1. And then you can interpret that adding 1, it will just only affect the arbitrary constant in the end for me. It will be just differ by 1. Okay, let's work it out and you see what I mean. Okay, so now we find the constant c by using the initial condition. That is, um, x, when x equals 0, y is negative 1. So we plug that in, plug in negative 1 for y, and plus 0 for x. So we have c here, and then we have 2 square 4. So this gives us c equal 4. Okay, so putting back the value c without changing the solution, we see that now we have the implicit form of the solution. Some function of y equal some function of x and the constant c is 4 here. We now notice that the function of y on the left hand side is a square. We know that we can take a square root and get y out of it and we will have some explicit form. Okay, so we see that if we take square root, then we have the explicit form, but we have two choices. Okay, so y minus 1 would equal to plus or minus the square root of this expression. And then moving 1 to the right hand side, and we have 1 plus minus this. Sorry, that has to be an x, not t. Okay, then which of these two choices is the correct one? So among the two choices, which sign is the correct one? The plus one or the minus one? And how do we determine? Well, we see that we have the initial condition, which we can use to verify that. So put back the initial condition in, we see that when x is zero, sorry, it's not t here, then we have 0 is 1 plus minus, put x is 0, I get square root of 4, which is 2, so is y0 would be 1 plus or minus 2 from the solution. 
And then from the initial condition, we see that y0 is given as negative 1. Okay, and then we see that um, choosing plus will give us 3, which is wrong. So choosing the minus sign will give us negative 1, which is correct. So we see that we have to choose the minus sign. And now we can write out the solution, the final solution in explicit form, okay, which is given here by picking the minus sign. Now let's try to ask some additional questions. Here's the question. On which domain of x values can the above solution be defined? To answer this question, we look at the solution form. We see that it contains a square root. So this comes with the restriction, that is, what's in the square root cannot be negative. So I have this restriction. In order to solve this inequality, let's attempt to factorize it. Combining the first two terms, taking out x squared, I will have x plus 2 remains. And then combining the last two terms, taking out 2, I will have again x plus 2. Now I see x plus 2 is a common factor. Again, taking x2 out, then I will have x squared plus 2 times x plus 2 is bigger than 0. Now using the fact that x squared plus 2 is always bigger than 2 and positive, then this becomes x plus 2 is bigger than 0, which means x shall be bigger than negative 2. Okay, so that will be the domain for this solution to be defined. Um, it might seem a bit hard with this approach, and which involves into the um, factorization of this polynomial, and which is not so obvious. There is an alternative argument we see that when x is negative 2, we see that y equals 1, if we plug in. And then, um, recalling the differential equation, which contains the term y minus 1 in the denominator, therefore, at this point, dy over dx will go to infinity. Therefore, the solution cannot be defined at this point. And since your initial condition is given at x equals 0, then you cannot extend your solution to the left, passing the point negative 2. Therefore, x has to be bigger than negative 2. OK, finally, let me show you the plot of the solution. It's shown in this graph here, and this uh, curve and it goes down to um, negative infinity. The initial data, um, y0 uh, equal negative 1, is marked with a cross sign. Okay. So this is the solution where we put the negative sign um, outside the square root. And we also observe that as x approaches negative 2, this derivative here approaches infinity because this approaches a vertical tangent. Now I also included um, the other solution. If you pick the um, plus sign, that is a symmetric part about this horizontal line on the upper part, which is shown in the dotted line. So let's say if your initial condition shall be given anywhere up here, then this branch would actually be the solution for you. OK, that's all I have to say for this example. I hope after these two examples, you will feel more confident 
are comfortable with these separable equations and the way to solve it and also giving some possible discussions on the solution behavior or on the domain of where the solution is defined. Okay, and uh, in the next video we will cover more examples, um, probably more complicated. So um, I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you next time.